This podcast is part of the Game and Entertainment Network. Visit tgenetwork.net to find the latest episodes from all our shows. It's time for Agro Chat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the thing. And sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 133. Tonight, I'm joined by Ashgar. This is not a sound check. No, it is not. Grace. I just finished chasing the cats away. <laughs> Damn! My dog is asleep. <laughs> and Thalen. My life is much more boring than the rest of yours. <laughs> Or has fewer pets, I guess. But hey, that too. you're going to be on a new computer. So you could have yeah, just said yeah, yeah. that. That's true. I, we'll, see, I, we'll see which part I forgot to order this time around. Oh, God. I need to be a God. case. So, like, I, I think I told you all the tale of this machine. Because it was another one of my Craigslist wheeling and dealing uh, things. And I got it, like, for a phenomenal deal. But the guy never finished building it. So, like, it wasn't 100% complete, so it had no operating system. It didn't have any disks for an operating system. Um, there's, like, a, lot, a bunch of stuff that had never been hooked up, so I had to make a, a mad last-minute dash out to Best Buy and buy some SATA cables. And, like, if you were going to make SATA cables to be generic, what color would you make them? Mine are blue. Probably black. I, I, I thought black. But no, no, like at Best Buy, they have blue SATA cables. So I have these hideously ugly blue SATA cables and an otherwise nice looking build. <laughs> Are they like? They're Best Buy blue. Okay. Yeah, no, they're yeah, absolutely thanks. Best Buy blue. They're not blue and yellow. So there's at least that. <laughs> but like I'd put it off and I'd put it off and I'd put it off for several weeks. Because like at first I was waiting on, on this and like I, I ordered an operating system. And I wanted a physical copy, so I had, like, a USB drive that I could install it off of that I can always go back to for anything. And, and there was, like, $10 difference between the two. I'm like, no, nope, I'm going to get, like, the, the official Microsoft USB version. So that, like, took two weeks to get in. And there, there was a power supply. Like, the power supply that was in it was, like, way too small. Um, you could tell this was like the, this person's very first foray into building a PC and that ah, they had, they had gone yeah. on to PC part picker and PC part picker will tell you exactly the wattage you need to run a machine. And he had exactly the wattage he needed to run his machine. The problem is my, my GTX 980 needed two eight pin, uh, connectors to, to run the video card. And it only had one six pin connector that was available. That would run whatever video card he had in it, but not what I wanted to put in it. So, but anyway, yeah, I I went way above the minimum watt. Theor theoretically, my this machine should need 389 watts. I got a 750 watt power supply because you know all it I takes. Know what you might eventually put in it. Exactly. All it takes is being burnt by it once. Exactly, and the price did for difference was like 10, 15 bucks. Well, like the I one that it recommended. I had a machine once upon a time that, like, when I added a DVD burner, other things started shutting off because it mm -hmm. ran out of power. Yep. So all it took was that one time for me to never want to do that again. So I'm just going to throw excess power at anything. <laughs> yeah. My, my current system was, I acquired it during Wrath of the Lich King because I remember I suddenly needed a new system to be able to raid Ice Crown because I updated the um, BIOS in my previous system, and there was a power flicker in the middle of updating the BIOS. Oh, no. And suddenly I had a brick. Oh, I vaguely remember this. Yeah. So that's, that's the system I still have. The majority of the internals have been replaced in the intervening time, but like the motherboard and the CPU are still the ones from, like, what? seven years ago yeah so yeah there's there's only so much that you can do upgrading the other parts yeah i've been limping along on a uh fx 6300 that i thankfully could overclock but like i have always been a huge fan of amd processors mostly because it always felt like you were getting more for your money's worth because they were yeah. way cheaper 
but that is not the case anymore. <laughs> no, this system is going to be the first Intel processor I've had in well over a decade. This is That's the same with this one. I have had AMD systems up until this point, and this is the first... Like, I've had, I've had, you know, i7 laptops, and I've always been frustrated that it felt like my laptop outperformed my desktop. Um, so this is like a an i7-5820 uh, x99 architecture. So it, is, it, 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 it does a really good job at editing our podcast, what little I edit. I imagine it does. But anyway. I was, I was one of the lucky ones and got the i5-2500K for my previous system. Which is the little processor that could? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that thing that could overclock immensely? Yes. Though so it lasted me well beyond it should have. Yeah, I'm going to have to switch to Intel for my next build. I don't think I have ever used an Intel processor since I have been building my own machines, which is a very long time. Yep. It makes me sad because, like, realistically... The architecture that has been around for the AMD dates back to the the Phenom series, and they've just kept limping it along and limping it along, and it never it, like when when everything went like crazy numbers of cores, it didn't really catch up compared to like its six core was not even vaguely close to a six core Intel anything. No. And I hate that Intel essentially now has a monopoly on these things mm. and. You like the the face value of the 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 processor that I got was like I think it's still I mean it's like a generation old and it's still three hundred and fifty bucks. I didn't I mean well I got everything for like around six hundred bucks so I was I was happy with my deal even though I had to do a lot of other stuff to get it to work. Although I I have to tell a tale about this system and it's still running this way. And I just haven't done anything about it. So when I when I got the thing, it looked like, oh, okay, so this has got a decent aftermarket cooler on it. And I have always been a fan of the uh, the Hyper Evo 212 cooler that's got the crazy heat pipes and the the ability to do a push pull fan on either side of the the uh, the heat sink. And this had like something similar, but not quite. I'm like, okay, well, this will work. So I, I get to putting it together, and usually, like, the fan screws to the side of the heat sink. Well, this was just kind of sitting on the heat sink. <laughs> so I did whatever I could to try and fix it into place, because at this point I was frustrated that it had been so long that I didn't want to order another part. Um, so yeah, it's it's running in that configuration right now. It had, like, these weird little rubber, rubber grommet things, and those were sitting up on top of the heat pipe. So I don't know if that's really the way it's supposed to be installed or not, but someday I will probably replace that. And this is the weirdest intro to Agar Chat ever. That seems unlikely. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that just was totally spontaneous, but whatever. Um, so it feels like it's been a long time since we've actually had a normal episode. Um, and I know it's not really the case. It's only been a couple weeks. But in that time, we have done Karazan, the new hey. Karazan. And I think, I, did we talk about our attunement at all on the show for Karazan? Did I remember? I don't think so. Honestly, I don't know how many weeks it's actually been out. I think it's, it's been, been roughly been a month. Three about three weeks. Mm hmm. Because okay. we missed the first week, and we've run it the last two weeks. So part of the reason why we missed the, the first week was we were trying to get attuned. And in order to attune for Karazhan, you have to run a sequence of four Mythics. And unfortunately, Mythics are a weekly lockout sort of thing. And it's not that you can't run them again. You just have to run them without you know loot, which is inopportune. And we got our wires crossed massively on what dungeons we needed. And I was, I was horrible and didn't check like Slack and <laughs> actually see which ones were needed. Uh, so that meant Grace needed a different batch than, you know, Ash, Thalen, or I did. But all in all, like we, we got together, like I think Saturday is when we finished up. Yeah. Um, and then Sunday, we're like, okay, we're going to try and run this place. And we had four people, <laughs> which is perennially our problem. 
in this game is that you know if we're just hanging with you know the aggro chat folks we have four people um so we could not get a fifth and we tried for probably 30 minutes to an hour to get a fifth of some sort to come online and run karazhan um and there were so, people around who would have liked to, but were not attuned also. Yeah. And that was the problem, especially that first week, was like, there were maybe nine of us total in the guild that were attuned. Um, and I know there was another group that, that did run, but I think they had to pug some people. Yuck. So we were, we were a full week behind when we started this thing. Um, and yeah. in two weeks, we have cleared Karazhan. And we were the first... We were the first guild group to clear Karazhan. Yeah, we 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 have been by far the most successful of the guild groups, and we're only running it one night a week. So um, we got significantly faster at a lot of it last week. The, Morose the is still an asshole. Morose yeah. is still an asshole. The interesting thing about Karazhan, though, is like it is real content. It is it is technically a five player mythic, but. It is a raid. Like, it is a raid in every bit the sense that you're... better gear than the first raid. It does. It sadly. Does. It's, I think it's harder than... It, like, I think it's significantly harder than, than normal Emerald Nightmare. Um, but I feel like this is a raid that has learned a lot from Final Fantasy XIV. Because there were a lot of the encounters that felt very Final Fantasy XIV ish The The only problem is, is that this is still... I wow. I disagree with you on that because... Oh, really? Well, the... You're thinking of the last boss, right? Yeah. Mostly. It's sort of like Final Fantasy XIV in that the same sorts of things occur in the same order every time. However, unlike Final Fantasy XIV, there is no RNG protection, and you can can get totally screwed. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. It's entirely possible that the same person can get targeted with both the big old laser beam and the puddles of poo falling and the from you while you person. run. Can be the tank. Could be the tank, yes. Which is just no. It's that's terrible. It's it's yeah. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Is like it it feels a lot like Final Fantasy fourteen, but it is still beholden to RNG and like you you. Well, I mean, there were a couple times where like, well, might as well wipe it up. I mean, we got bad luck early on. But I know I'd like to talk more about like the raid overall because. I mean, the place is definitely, like, it is current content, and it feels like a little mini raid. And it is also absolutely a love letter to the original Karazhan. Yeah, they did a really good job with that. It's funny, though, because Karazhan was the first raid I ever did because Tam dragged me into it on the day I hit 70. <laughs> good times. But the, like, most of it I haven't seen, did not see when it was current. I saw it come back later, coming back and either soloing it or with an overleveled group. For a long time, I was able to solo up to chess. Soloing chess was kind of difficult. I still can't solo chess. Soloing chess is still pretty annoying. It's annoying. Yeah. It's very, it's, it's doable, again, very but it's random. annoying. But that meant that most of the parts that are part of Nukara are parts I'm, I'm familiar with. Except the whole, you know, the Nightbane thing. Maybe we'll get there eventually. I, yes. I hope we will, but man, that is really fast. So... Uh, Okay, previously you summoned Nightbane through completing a quest. A, a long, interesting a long quest involving question. a whole bunch of stuff outside of the actual instance, too. Yep. But you got a cauldron that you could then summon Nightbane with. This time around, it is absolutely a speed check. So you have to clear within a certain time uh, and hit these various checkpoints within a certain time. And then that allows you to summon Nightbane and fight him. And that 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 last boss is significantly higher item level than the rest of the raid. I want to say it's like the baseline is 875. That might be right. Sounds right. I mean, for, for Nightbane it is? I think so. That's Yeah, that seems likely. The latter half of the raid is... The latter half of Karazhan is 860 item level stuff. Well, the intro is 860, I think. 855. I'm confusing myself now. Yeah, the first the first half is 855 up through Adamant, or maybe more up through Moros, and then from Curator on is 860. But I mean, Nightbane has to have pretty high item level stuff to be worth it because to be able to summon it, to be able to get there fast enough, like I'm sure it's 
possible to do that in lower level gear, but it's not reasonable to do that in lower level gear. That's actually Kai's complaint, in that Kara in general feels like it does not give rewards in line with what it asks for. I, I agree with that. Well, that's honestly, in general, my problem with the Mythic Plus system. It's, is it, it, it complained about the majority of Mythic and Mythic Plus content in this expansion. Is that by the time you can realistically do this thing, it's not that useful. I mean, for me, like, I am enjoying this trip down memory lane and doing... Or more so, I, I'm enjoying the same feeling I had when I did Karazhan. It's not the same zone. It's the same difficulty level. Because, like, I remember struggling at doing this content back in the day when we were doing it legitimately. And these encounters are still tough. Like, we are significantly better geared than I was back then, so we are doing better. But the other day when we did this with a significantly worse geared group than the the four of us are it was way tougher yeah it was a struggle and we got through one, one boss yeah one boss so the nice thing about it is at least for me because it's so nostalgic and because i enjoy the people that we run with in in both groups like i had a good time even though we were kind of not doing so great yeah just I feel bad that I didn't do it today. It's just like after last night, I couldn't handle two raid nights in a row. The, the, the thing is, is it's got some really weird encounters. Like the Mana Devourer fight is, well, the whole sequence leading up to the Mana Devourer fight is truly bizarre in that you, you kind of have a, a Alice Through the Looking Glass thing going on where you get super tiny and... You end up doing battle with things like, you know, there are rats roaming around. And the rats are actually battle pet versions of the rats. And they use battle pet moves that you have to avoid. It's really weird. Beth in the instance is you enter from what used to be the back door after opera. Oh. Therefore, the what? first thing you have to do is do opera. Huh, interesting. Yeah, and then you're working your way down. What's, so, you, so there is no going up after that. There is actually. You there is a venture. Once back. you beat Morose, he drops some keys and you can go up and beat Curator. Okay. I was wondering, like, Curator was such an iconic fight. Yeah. Well, Curator's still there and Curator is also kind of a dick. Yes, it, it's annoying. It's annoying, uh, but no one is worse than Morose. Sorry, but Morose is, is the fight that will make healers cry. It's, it's the just, only melee in there. I think I'm allowed to be complain more about Curator. I, I guess that's Hey, fair. I am also a melee. I am having to deal with this as well. You always have to deal with it regardless. <laughs> so we, we ended up landing on a strategy with Curator where... Okay, so Curator is basically a race to kill Curator before you run out of places to stand. And so every so often... The old you, Curator mechanics, it's, or it's not that different. He doesn't hit, you know, the, a hateful strike somebody other than the tank. Right. But every so often, he just spits out puddles at all players, you know, in the room. Oh, God. And he's persistent until he dies. Yep. Oh, so it's the Guild Wars 2 strategy. Or the Titan strategy. Yeah. Yep. We, we basically use the Titan strategy. Everybody stack up. When the puddles happen, we all move together. And depending on how well we are doing that, it dictates how much room we have left at the end. And we quickly learned that, like, we did not have enough DPS to get him down in two goes. Like, he still does the, the invocation step. Evocates. Yeah. Evocate, yeah. And that's when you burn him. But we could not get him down within that second evocate. So that meant we needed to divide the room into three parts instead of two parts. So we had to conserve as much space as humanly possible. And that's when we started stacking up. And I think it was pretty much like the next time we downed him. Oh, there were a few times when... We discover what happens if you stack up and don't move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, much like Titan. <laughs> oh, whoops. We got hit nine times. We're all dead. Yeah, basically. Tank is like, hey, I could use a... Oh, you... Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, why are you guys not moving? 
But honestly, like every single fight that we did was largely a, a matter of us working through the mechanics, then figuring out whatever worked best for us to mitigate the, the problem. I mean, some of them are pretty straightforward in that, like, maiden of virtue. I don't think anybody's going to do a, a different strategy than we did. Like, I'm not sure if there is one. Well, you really of virtue is pretty much the old strategy. Yeah. Yep. Except with the additional complication of you need to burn her so and interrupt her stupid thing. Right. Well, like, I think Puddles disappeared in the original one. Well, she, what it was, was in the original one, she, she channeled the thing centered on her. She basically and you had to run concentrate. into, yeah. She she basically made a concentrate, and you had to run into it so that when she stunned everybody, it kicked you out of it, and then you ran out of the consecrate. Yeah, so it's it's the reverse of that. Yeah, now she's throwing it onto other people, and it's slowly filling the room. It, basically, every fight is pretty much like the old version of the fight, but with one or two like changes or additions. But the basic premise is the same. Atman I will not has... move when Flame Wreath is cast. The raid <laughs> blows up. Yes. And boy, does the raid blow up, as I discovered. did not discovered. expect actual instant death for everyone in the room. <laughs> yeah, well, it I used to, to be just be like the person it. in there, what, didn't it? It would or did... hit the no, room, it would, but it wouldn't it would be hit hit instantly fatal. Yeah. Yeah, it would it was... knock you in the air, and that would probably be fatal, unless you yeah. were a rogue. But the Atuman is basically a new encounter. Yeah, it's that one it was very surprising. And also, and it, I'm not a fan of. So, one thing in this expansion, Blizzard has definitely kind of, in a couple different places, raised some middle fingers to various add ons. And, <laughs> um, and so, you know, and have gotten rid of the ability to do some kinds of range checks and things. But also, um, yeah, the Adam and Fight is like a giant middle finger to healers who use add-ons to dispel because everyone gets a debuff but only one person is the real person with a debuff who has like a little ghost hanging out over their head and it's really hard to see and it's obnoxious and yeah spelling the wrong person causes the raid to blow up yes yep. spelling everyone at once causes us to instantly die without realizing what happens <laughs> yay revival oh wait <laughs> That was exciting, though. The, it was so, really funny the first time. New Karazhan is definitely, like, I, I, I've said this on my blog, I've said this to multiple people, like, it is the most fun I have had in a really long time laughing my ass off on the way back from a wipe because yep. something silly happened that we weren't expecting and everyone died horribly. <laughs> well, so yeah, like, the prime example is previously on Adamon. You had to kill all the horses. If you killed all the horses, you could leave any of the other trash up because, you know, it only cared about the horses. That's not the case anymore. All the blacksmiths behind him also pull. Yup. So, like, we go to... We, go to pull, we pulled out of it and uh, that happened. Yup. So, yeah, we, we cleared all those people. And then we tried it again. And then we learned that, oh, hey, there's a point at which we all really have to get exactly in the same spot because otherwise the tank dies and then everyone else dies because there's a horrible shared fate type attack but it 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 casts immediately after some things that you have to absolutely not be standing in a mortal strike yes an aoe mortal strike except unlike normal mortal strikes that half your healing this one just halves your health and then we learned that ghost ponies are awful and we hate yes yes yep because it does a thing kind of like, uh, God, what dungeon is that? The vault. It Flashbacks the... to the vault. Yeah. yeah Mog Mogashan vaults, the Ghost Kings, had had that effect. Also FF14's things... the vault. FF14 yeah. has it, yeah. Lines of things come across the room, but it's not just like one at a time. It's two at a time. So you have to find both gaps. I think the funniest moment for me, though, was Westfall's story. <laughs> Because, like, the, the, the murlocs are the sharks. And they're wearing and shark fins. And they're wearing shark fins. And the, uh, the Defias-looking guys are the jets. And they absolutely dance fight. That's amazing. And the idle animation for the sharks is that the murlocs just sit there snapping while waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And then we did... Uh, 
Beauty and the Beast last week, and like all the characters from the Disney Beauty and the Beast are there, yeah, and all, uh, all the uh, first animated staff bots of bands, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. And uh, Lumineer is essentially a kobold with a candle as head, and that gets tanked off by itself, and then. The dust broom runs around and it chases people and you have to burn it first and you have to make sure that it doesn't go through the fire because it speeds up if it goes through the fire. And Mrs. Cauldrons, I think, was that? The soup kettle. The soup kettle, yeah, is constantly doing AOE frost damage. <laughs> and then at the very end, you you end up fighting basically like a, a giant stove and it summons fork ads and the forks like... Are, are insane they do like a whirlwindy kind of thing and they have to be burnt down quickly but most importantly when you finish the opera event and you go backstage there's all of the actors from the old opera events and you can yep. go up to the big bad wolf and say do the thing say the thing i'm a big fan come on <laughs> the thing. and he does run away little girl Run away. Yeah, apparently there are weekly quests for Karazhan. I think they unlock once you've cleared it once. Because when I went there to run old Karazhan earlier this week, there was a quest available. And this week it is to kill 10 mana devourers. <laughs> but I think the one, apparently the one last week was to find some stuff for the old cast. Like find a good review for Romulo and, and Julianne so they'll stop fighting. And <laughs> some flowers. They apparently for, hate each other. Yeah, some flowers for the 10 man and something else i think like red riding hood's cloak i'm hoping we get wicked this week because i, I want to see that one i wonder it's... if there's an achievement for doing all three there is. i think there is yeah i am so disappointed that they didn't do phantom as one of the, the choices <laughs> this time well I, I guess the thing that kind of disappoints me about that is like so they're, they're new fights but they kind of have the same thing going on that the previous ones did well it's like the majority of the fights you know, they're the same but different. Like, yeah. yeah. Westfall story is like, okay, West Side story Romeo was Romeo and Juliet. So the fact that the fight is reminiscent of the Romeo and Juliet fight is not really surprising. Yeah. And Wicked will be like, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Well, would it? I don't because know. Like... The Wizard of Oz one was more like the uh, Beauty and the Beast one. I guess it's true. So, what's the other one that the Riding Hood would be the missing one? Okay, I have no idea if that's going to be related in any way. So apparently, Wicked, you are fighting, you are fighting the Wicked Witch of the West and your and Glinda together, and they and they share health. And of course, there is an ability called Defy Gravity. I'm sure. looking at the abilities; it really doesn't look like any of the previous ones very much. Hmm. Well, I'll be excited. Hopefully, it, it will be up this week so we can see it. And the other big thing that's happened since we last recorded a show is that we have essentially gone from working on Emerald Nightmare to having Emerald Nightmare on farm enough status to where we can do it on an off night in like half the time it used to take us. Yeah. And we have begun working on Trials of Valor, which is the three boss mini raid that they patched in as a tweener between... Yep. Emerald, uh, Dream, and Nighthold. And uh, once again, we're we're being tested by Odin. And uh, we absolutely... How is he going to do this? I don't know. Like, he only has 10% more health. So, in the first, like, encounter with Odin, you... God, you get him down to, what, 30% health, I think? No, it's like 80. Oh, 80% yeah. health? Yeah, in Halls of Valor, he stops when you hit 80% health. Okay. But yeah, like, so he is still, you know, he just says, no, 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 you, you've done well enough. And then this time he goes down to 10% health and that fight is some madness. Like it has a lot of moving Seems parts. It's crazy for a tank. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. The, the last phase is horrible, but <laughs> I well, think. And it's horrible partially for the same reasons that we always complain about. Like when there's something bad on the floor in like ff14 you know exactly where it is in that in in this odin fight in this raid there's like bad stuff on the floor and the floor is slightly very different glowy. color than the nice yeah. than, the, than the perfectly fine floor yes like, it is very subtle and it is not fun to like have like, to figure it out quickly 
there is a hard line between good floor and bad floor, but unfortunately those lines are in like divide the room into thirds. So it's hard to tell immediately when it comes up which third is the good one. Right. I was struggling to figure out where to run to next. The biggest problem in that last phase is that spear that gets thrown on the tank that will blow the tank up if you're too close to Odin. It'll also blow up anybody in the radius of the tank if you're too close to Odin. And the problem is, is like with most tank swaps, tank swaps just don't happen instantly. Like, it takes a second for the tank to realize it is time for swap time and to taunt off and then you can run away. Um, And how we finally mitigated that towards the end is that essentially we were standing on opposite ends of the safe zone and when it came time to taunt, we would taunt, and then the other person would run as far into that corner as they could while Odin was running to the other tank. And mostly, I started doing that because I was thinking of the ads on Bismarck, where you had to keep them far away from each other. So I was like, well, maybe that'll work here, and it seems to, but that was one of those adjust-on-the-fly kind of things, and I am super thankful that Art caught on to what I was doing. I will say, speaking as a melee, I really hope you find a different way to do that in our I, I don't know a better way. Like, I can't run away in time. Because the taunt happens too soon that we don't have our movement buff up each time. No. Like, like I'm, having, I'm basically having it to do that swap three times in every cooldown of a movement speed buff. So, like, th- those were... Like, I, I hate that I'm making the melee run around like crazy, but... <laughs> melee are used to running around like crazy so it's not wrong <laughs> at least the casters can stand still because that's you know mostly what casters are used to doing when they dps oh they can't they really oh they can't can. they can turn it really else. can't well yeah everyone has yeah. their own thing to deal with during that phase there's a lot there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in that fight um and what what i what i thought was interesting was the way it was basically like a remix of the fight we had already done because you have the symbols on the ground, but instead of you needing to run to a symbol on the ground, you need to drag an ad to a symbol on the ground. Because they can only die if they're in that symbol. And Guarm is a horrible snake puppy with really bad breath. I don't know who decided that it would be a good idea to like put a dog skin on a Hydra model, but it's terrible. It's really disturbing. It, it's, yeah. It, I do not like it. I do not approve. Yeah, they're, they have a perfectly serviceable Cerberus model. They use it all the freaking time. But admittedly, that one only has two heads. Yeah. You think of the Core Hound? Yeah. Also used for, you know, Kirkin and Omen. Yeah. Yeah, I assumed that was the model they were going to use. I think it's the model they were using until the raid actually released. Yeah, ah. like the sleepy version when you went down in while questing, I think, used that. I have not done that on a character since the raid came out and know if they replaced, to know if they replaced the model. But yeah, the end result is a really, really creepy dog-looking thing. Yes. That's, that's necks don't really move like they should for anything other than a snake. And the hardest part there is that it's, it's one of those fights where everyone in the raid has to move or they die. They just get one shot. Yep. And it is also a DPS check. So if we lose that any... over in four minutes, no matter yeah. how long you're doing. Yeah, so, so basically, you, you cannot afford to lose a DPS, period. You cannot afford to lose healers. You cannot afford to lose the tanks, because there's also something going on with the tanks where they have to soak damage together, and all the range can't ever get hit by that thing. Um, there's also like a color mechanic where you take a debuff, and everybody that got that debuff shares damage but you can't ever swap debuffs or you just get one shot. Um, And then the charge thing is just like the icing on the cake that every so often it'll charge around the container and you kind of have to like see what side it's coming down, run to the other side. And then when it gets and turns around, run to the opposite side. So I don't know. Like I, I don't necessarily feel like we've really had an attempt where we, had all of those things working together and we haven't like had people comfortable enough to really put out max damage nope i mean and and at least on the healing front it seemed like the healers were really trying to adjust as well because like 
Art and I talked afterwards, and oh my god, we were so low all the time. Yeah, and it, I mean, it was problematic because, you know, everyone was still learning the fight, and so DPS were taking a lot of unnecessary damage, and so we were spending more time than we should healing them instead of trying to keep you guys topped off. And it just, you know, in a situation like that, it very quickly becomes this sort of domino where you lose track of everything and you're boned. Yeah, I think it's just mostly going to be one of those things that as we get used to things, we will get better and that will go smoother. And then once we have it down, we will never struggle with it again. Yeah, <laughs> but then we will get to go fight my girlfriend, hell yeah. And the, I can tell you, having done that fight on LFR, that is going to be a really interesting time because that even on LFR... That fight has a lot of moving parts. I guess at some point this weekend, I should probably run LFR. I, I mean, I would nah. suggest it. I always like doing it before the real raid if I can, because it lets me kind of get a sense of the fight without there being any sort of... You know, there's no stakes. Like, I don't care about it. So I can see it and see what the pieces look like, but they probably won't kill me unless I'm really dumb. So I have to say, like, right now, when it comes to raiding, it feels really good that we are essentially current. Like, we are ready to do all this content, but then I have a huge, massive complaint in that there is a quest associated with Emerald Dream, or Emerald Nightmare, that none of us are even vaguely close to, to being done with. I think you are hey. now actually the closest. I'm yep. vaguely close. What, a, what are you at? Thalen, Thalen might be ahead of you. I have Gash 25 out of 30. Oh, no, I'm at 10, yeah. Okay, I'm at 22. Grace... Yeah, so Grace is winning. But all that means is that for the next three weeks, I won't get any. Yeah, so there are these. There, there's this quest as part of the Balance of Power quest line, which unlocks a hidden, art, well, not hidden, but an artifact appearance. And it is the first one in the line, so you can't actually use any of the ones after it until you've unlocked it. Um... And one of the steps is to collect 30 Corrupted Essence from Emerald Nightmare. Now, it can only be Emerald Nightmare, normal or heroic, or I don't know, maybe mythic? I don't normal know if mythic. Better. Yeah, normal or better. Yeah. So, not LFR. You can't run this in LFR. And it is a total RNG crapshoot if you get one on killing a boss. Um, like, last... Uh, Wednesday when we raided, I got two. And we took down I don't know how many bosses at this point. There are seven it's bosses in there. Seven bosses. Um, I know people that go weeks without getting one. I think maybe GU didn't get any last week? Last week I got none. So, Actually, no, I think I got one from Xavius. This week I got two. So the frustrating thing is, is like, we are ready to either, you know, move to Heroic or focus entirely on Trials of Valor but it feels like we can't really stop farming uh, Emerald Nightmare until people are through that quest. And it reminds me of the way it very much felt like we could not stop farming Molten Core, even though we were doing Blackwing Lair. And, I mean, even once we you know get a majority of people through that quest step, there's also quite a few classes that have hidden artifact appearances in there that I'm sure mm -hmm. will cry and until they get their artifact appearance, me included. Yeah, totally. Me. <laughs> which, which also reminds me of Vanilla and the way that a handful of classes cared about AQ40 and no one else cared about AQ40. So I don't know, like that's that's a little bit of a frustration. I really like the raid content. I've I've enjoyed it, but it feels like there's not a great transition between them in that you're still needing the previous one to complete some stuff. I wouldn't mind if like I don't mind that those quests exist, but I would like them to be not quite so RNG dependent that you could be, you know, deep into the next raid, like when Nighthold comes out. And still have people who, because of RNG, are still way behind on that quest, right? Like, just make it some crazy number of things and let them all drop off of each boss. And so you know exactly how many times you have to run it. 
and then you can be done with it. Like so even unfortunate that the quest to you know there is a quest to kill Scenarius four times in order to skip straight to Scenarius in the future. And at this point, having missed a few raids, I have now completed that quest. And yet, still, I don't think anyone has finished their corrupted essences. No, haven't. We were talking about it before raid, and like at that point, I thought I was like the closest, but it turns out I guess Grace is. But still, and that's only because I pugged that raid last week when I had to miss it. Otherwise, I would be way behind. Still means you've run the same number of times as Bell. Like, I would be okay if it were RNG off of, like, the first X number, or first five bosses, and then guaranteed off of Scenarius and Xavius. At least that would be the maximum potential number of runs. Right, yeah. right. Well, and it's, you know, I mean, I have other complaints about, like, the RNG of the the weapon skins, too, right? Like, they're, uh, you know, they tried to make things interesting or unique in some cases for some classes, and so there's lots of different ways to get these hidden artifact appearances. But what ends up happening is that you have some folks like, some of the hunter specs who can just literally go to a vendor and purchase their fancy hidden appearance and for good reason because swapping between guns and bows is kind of a thematic thing and i get that but still like they can just go and buy theirs some are off of world bosses which may be weeks and weeks and weeks in between when that particular world boss is up. Um, and some are random drops off of various raid bosses. And there's just, you know, there's no guarantees. And it's frustrating. Like, my mage could go and kill mobs in Suramar and farm for her hidden appearance if I cared enough about it. But... My monk, which is my main, is dependent on a drop from a raid boss that I can get, you know, max of realistically two chances at in a week. So the question I have is, is balance of power an account-wide achievement? Uh, no. Nope. Oh You're my fine. god, that is so miserable then. Yep. I, yep. Like, I will only realistically ever get that weapon appearance on one character. Yep. I'm sure they'll nerf it at some point. Nope. I they've, mean, I'm pretty sure they've know. already said that, like, some of the artifact Yeah, but I'm pretty sure they just said a stupid thing. Well, like, I, yeah. So I'm pretty I, sure they're going to go back on that one because there they are. Will, eventually. Like, the achievement for uh, Glory of the Hero is locked behind that quest line. Uh. So I'm pretty sure they're going to, at some point, change that. Because as of right now, you need to complete that quest line to unlock that row, which contains the rewards for Glory of the Hero. Uh, whatever the one is for killing eight world bosses. Uh, monstrous, for... whatever. Unleashed monstrosities. Yeah. And the one for beating a level 15 keystone dungeon. I don't actually know if anybody's done yet. Kai's probably got the highest of any of us. Yeah, but that's a, he's been up to like plus eight? Uh, he tried a plus 10 or a plus 12. I don't remember. I don't know if he made it through or not. I mean, he obviously made it through, but I don't think he made it to the timer. Yeah, all of those things are locked behind this quest line. So even if you complete those relatively difficult achievements, or at least time-consuming achievements, you can't have a, your appearance until you do this quest. And I feel like, oh, around the time we see our 8th world boss, that's going to get really loud. Well, okay, so had they given us credit for, for Withered Gem, that would have been this week. <laughs> like, they, after, after they gave us Withered Gem twice in a row, they updated that achievement to include Withered Gem. <laughs> so none of us have that credit for withered gem but that would have been eight we have seen eight bosses so we'll see what happens next week yeah like i secretly want it be to be nidhogg again but for selfish reasons i <laughs> wonder if it will be because or if it'll be the one who drops the uh frost appearance maybe well we've never seen the one that like there there are two more that we've never seen i think and so one of those two is the one that drops the frost appearance we don't know which one it is. It also seems a little cool. Like, they could have... <laughs> this is go back to what you were saying earlier. It's a little stupid that they stuck an appearance for a glass on a world boss that has not actually spawned. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this is this is why it's silly. Like I said, is some of them 
someone can walk up the minute that they hit 110 and totally get it and others like you could be waiting realistically for months and not have any solid expectation of seeing it i mean at least they had the sense to change the ones that drop from world bosses to be a guaranteed drop because holy cow i can't imagine the that amount late of is too rage. late for warriors yeah yeah yep. because we've already had nidhogg once drops from nidhogg who was our yeah. very first world boss. But at least they know that when it comes back around, they will have like they will be done as long as they can log in during that week. Well, thankfully, I've gotten the other two parts, and one of those is still a random chance, like off of uh, the fell dude in, in Halls of Valor. Yeah. He has a chance of dropping one of the parts for the, the Fury Warrior. I actually have two out of the four for my class now. The rest of one is randomly out of the plants that grow in the Druid class hall. So, of course, I got that one and I don't use it. The Pharaoh one involves taking a trip through the uh, Dreamway several times. Yeah, I have the tank one for my class because it's from the class hall, but I don't tank. And so, the, and here's the other frustrating piece, of course, is like all of those hidden appearances have various extra fancy colors and recolors that require you to do X number of things while wearing that skin. So people who already have one are already unlocking or have unlocked extra appearances like Bell. Yeah, and the the thing that sucks about that is the fact that there's only one set of extra appearances. So once you've unlocked it for one weapon, now I have that that slot for all weapons. And like... Realistically, I guess I should be doing world quests with in my tank spec, which I hate and I'm not very good at, and I have no points in my weapon. But at least then I would be working towards unlocking the do 200 world quests with a hidden appearance. And then when I get the weapons I actually want, I w- would have the skin. But other ones like run a bunch of dungeons with a hidden appearance, those are not going to happen with my tank spec. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, I feel like I've only made a dent in that one, even though it seems like I run a bunch of dungeons, but apparently I really don't. Well, 100 is a large number. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm like but around 30. The effort, effort between, between 200 world quests and 100 dungeons is very large. The third one, of course, is kill 1,000 players while using a hidden artifact appearance. Which doesn't seem like that would actually take that long. Probably wouldn't if you entered any battleground in which involved, you know. Like, like if you actually cared about PvP, yeah, that one would probably be pretty quick. Okay, so I don't know if we have anything else really to add about World of Warcraft. And the thing is, is like, all these complaints that we made, we're still playing on a daily basis and still enjoying it. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that's the biggest surprise of this expansion. Like, I fully expect to come back, like, hang out for a while and have some fun, and then get bored and wander away. And... The pace of content that they have released, the amount of things to do, has kept me completely busy and content. And as much as I whine about hidden appearances and fancy outfits, which of course is the true end game, but still, like I have so much to do that I'm not in any hurry to make a major swap to another MMO for a while. I haven't even gotten through the new Suramar stuff. I haven't like, even gotten through the old Suramar stuff. <laughs> like, apparently I should, because if we do, you know, get all those corrupted essences and so on and so forth, the next step involves, you know, Quarter Stars and, and whatever the other one is. Darkway. Yeah, you should unlock those dungeons, because they're actually kind of neat. You should unlock those dungeons, because it's actually kind of hell to find people to run those dungeons with. Because people we're, haven't unlocked them. Because <laughs> people haven't unlocked them, yeah. Because I was trying to help a friend run some mythics, and like, granted, it was like at 8 or 9 in the morning on a Sunday morning, so not exactly prime time. But we, we managed to, to pull together a mythic or two, but no, like most of the people didn't have Court of Stars and uh, Arcway unlocked. So that limited what we could actually run. So because... I have been playing so much WoW, I haven't been playing a lot of other MMOs, and one of the MMOs that has kind of been in a holding pattern for me is Rift, and probably the 
least well announced expansion ever came out this week. Uh, Starfall Prophecy is the new expansion for Rift, and like it was, I, I don't know. Like I, for the longest time, I didn't even know what the release date was. Like I knew it was a thing, I knew it was coming, uh, but like it, it's just been bizarre how low key this thing has been. Like I think I've seen some stuff about it. I didn't realize it was actually an expansion. Yeah, no, it's a it's another expansion along the lines of, well, and honestly, like that's part of the confusion because they have been in this weird holding pattern on what exactly their content release model is going to be. So Storm Legion was a traditional expansion. And then Nightmare Tide was this weird piecemeal thing where you bought the content you actually wanted. So if you wanted new clashes, you bought new classes. If you wanted, you know, the, the, the enhancements to said classes, you bought those. But the actual content itself was open to everybody. Like, regardless if you're a patron or aka subscribing or if you you know only had the base souls and they caught a lot of hell because like one of the things that got unlocked if you bought the nightmare tides pack was a slot of gear the earring slot and that's understandable why they yeah. catch hell for that yeah because like that put anyone that didn't have it that was trying to do any serious content at a major disadvantage because like that's one entire slot worth of gear that you didn't have. So this time around, they're just like, they, they switched back to this is an expansion. You, you buy it and you get access to content. That's it. Like you, you buy the expansion, no piecemeal way of getting around it. Um, now you can buy it with cash shop currency, which means in theory you could buy Rex, which is their, their Plex con, basically their version of Plex. And in theory, I think you could eventually get an expansion off of it. So like, I think there's ways that you, around it, but, but really it's, it's an expansion. Like they're expecting you to, to spend money on it. Um, and all in all, like, I'm kind of happy they went back to that model because the weird, are we free? Are we paid content thing didn't really seem to work that well because it, it felt really awkward where the boundaries of what is Nightmare Tides content and what is just other content. Because like during the Nightmare Tides cycle, they released several major content patches, but like it, 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 it was hard to determine whether or not this was just a base game improvement or if this was expansion content. Or at least it was for me. Um, this expansion, it, it, it follows up after a raid from last expansion. And I kind of wish that they they have this thing called inter, Intrepid Adventures where they basically like let you run through old raids as though it were an instant adventure. And what's cool about that is there's a lot of story packed into the raids and it lets you experience, you know, the story content as though you're raiding it, even though you're just kind of running around wild with a bunch of other people. And I wish before this expansion they had released the Comet of Enquete raid as an intrepid adventure because I'm going into this not really knowing some of the lore. So as much as I understand, Enquete is this sentient, like, creation engine-like machine that is on its way to crash smack dab into Talara. And I don't know if it's going to destroy it or what it's going to do, but it's going to basically, like, crash into the world as we know it. And now we are venturing onto the comet. And as this creation engine has traveled through various planes trying to get to Talara, it's picked up chunks of content with it. So, like, it passed through the plane of life and it passed through the plane of fire. So now there's, like, two zones worth of land mass that have gotten drug along kind of in the wake of this comet. So you're exploring that area and there's like all these people that used to be in the planes and have now been displaced onto this comet and don't really understand what's going on um and honestly like some of it's really charming um i've mostly been playing on 
uh, Scather and Forest, which is like the plane of life content right now. And there's this town of, you know, cute little animals that talk. And you are trying to save them from the Tuatha de Danann, essentially, that are, I guess, the, the former rulers of the plane. Or I don't know if they're I don't know if they're rulers of the plane originally, or if they came from another part of the plane of life that got you know displaced onto this content. But but they're basically taking over these these this cute village of you know talking animals. And what's hilarious is like you're trying to save these people or these these critters, and they have little conversations, and they're they're funny as hell. Like you encounter a burrow full of. Uh, badgers and they're having a conversation to see if they can just burrow under the trouble and then one of them points out that they're in a comet and burrowing down is probably not a good idea and there's like a a burrow full of hedgehogs and several of the hedgehogs have gotten stuck while rolling and they're confused and they're rolling in a little ball and then one of them finally proclaims just let go of your feet and they do and they stop rolling (laughs) Um, like there's another area where I was playing hide and seek with a bunch of unicorns because they had gone out and, and, and they went and hid and nobody had come to find them. So I had to go find them and bring them back to the the fold so that they could evacuate. So it's, it's, it's really charming content so far for, you know, being like Rift is always kind of twisted. Like it, it's interpretation of, of the Fae is definitely on the dark side of the fey and you encounter a lot of fey in the the lifelands but like these really liked rift's interpretation of like the plane of life like a lot of usually it's seen as opposite to you know the plane of things that kill you but rift has sort of an overgrown plants where everything is still trying to kill you right right it's it's more the magic the gathering green deck style of life where no, this stuff will absolutely kill you. Like, it's still dangerous. It's still very dangerous. Um, and what's hilarious is, like, you're encountering the Fae this time, but, like, there's this one guy that absolutely says, you know, I'm just a functionary. Like, I'm a bean counter of the Fae. I don't know how to organize an, an evacuation. So you totally help them, you know, get people out of the area. And uh, the other thing, like... <laughs> I have to give them credit that basically I, I know like ages ago Rift did the faction as fiction patch, but it seems like they've just straight up buried the hatchet between Guardians and Defiance. Um because like in this area, like you're 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 running around, even though I'm Defiant, I'm running around with like someone that was one of the NPCs from Sanctum. And if you go to like the, the base of operations as we're trying to, you know, mount an offensive on this comet and there's Ash Katari just hanging out and helping direct things. So like, it's definitely both factions are trying to stop this comet from crashing into the world. And they're not even giving the hint of fighting with each other, which is something that I really would love to see more of in world of Warcraft, because if there is something that really is big enough, that is to threaten the world, like, can't we all work together to fight it? And to some extent, that's happening in Legion, but there's still weird little vestiges of, of faction content. But I've not made it terribly far into Starfall. Um, I'm just in the very first zone. I've only gained one level and about halfway through the next. But all in all, I like this direction as opposed to Nightmare Tides. Um, I just, like for whatever reason, I struggled to get into the last expansion. And so far, the, the the narrative of this expansion feels better. And I think part of what made the last expansion so weird is it was essentially the bottom of the ocean. Like, it was in the plane of the water, and it was a drained version of the plane of water as someone was taking the water away. And the landscapes felt so foreign. Um, I mean, they're like, you know, coral beds and stuff like that. And it was cool, but it was kind of a a technicolor assault on the eyes. Everything was like, you know, magenta and, you know, bright orange and pink and... Which is sort of hilarious, considering what the actual bottom of the ocean looks like. 
Well, I mean, this is the plate of water. Apparently they have a much more exciting bottom of the ocean. But it was just, it was too much, you know, sensory input at once. Um, And by the time you got to, like, the glacier area, like, that was cool. Like, it was was a really awesome snow zone with cool skies. And But those early areas just struggled to grab me because it was just too much, too much paint splashed on the screen at once. So another thing that came out this week is Dishonored 2. And Tam, I know you've been playing a lot of it. Uh, I finished my first playthrough. And once again, you are clean hands, whatever, 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 right? Uh, yeah. So, I play a lot of stealth games. I don't know, maybe <laughs> it's maybe it's come up once or twice. Um, and I really love... One of the things that I really think is cool about, especially more modern stealth games, um, and I really liked this about hitman when it first came out was so many games are like kill everything the challenge is killing everything find all of the things and murder them and like i really liked hitman when it when it came out because that part was easy it wasn't hard to just you know go in and shoot everything what was hard was pulling it off effectively like nobody sees you nobody's alerted being being smarter than the level being smarter than the guards being so on and so i i really love that like the that kind of stealth game feels like it rewards being smarter than the the game uh and dishonored is one of those games that really rewards it um one of the things that i one of the biggest criticisms of the first game that i think is totally legitimate is that the game rewards you for playing without being seen or harming other people, but it's the least interesting way to play it because most of the tools are you get are lethal. Um, and they really upped the number of non-lethal choices you have in Dishonored 2 um, while also upping the difficulty massively. It's probably the hardest stealth game I've ever played um, without, without it feeling unfair. Uh, I, I kind of feel like it's really important that stealth games feel consistent and fair, but uh, I feel like at the at, at least at the hardest difficulty setting, um, Dishonored Two regularly surprised me. Uh, one of the one of the moments that my original plan was to go in, get the clean hands, which is nobody dies. You you beat the entire game without any without killing anybody, and Ghost, which is nobody notices you. You are never uh, you are never spotted, which is not the same as never being noticed because you can do things that like make sounds and distract people, but they can never see you. Uh, and there's a third optional path that is uh, deny the outsider's gift, which is no magic. Oh, wow. So you can tell because as you, you can play as either Corvo or Emily. Uh, and I wanted to play as Emily because I thought Emily was a really compelling character in the first one. And I love the idea of her having her own game. And so one of the things you can do as Emily and also Corvo is basically tell the outsider to go F himself. And he's like, well, all right, guess I won't give you any powers then uh, later. And you don't get anything from him. Uh, And so my plan was like, yeah, I'm going to play no powers, clean hands, ghost on the hardest difficulty. And in the, not in the tutorial, but in the first like, here's what you can actually expect from the game level, it taught me that I was not going to do that. That was not going to happen. I could I could see doing a deny the gift murdery playthrough. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, I know. Like, you can absolutely kill your way through all the levels without technology or, or I mean, not technology, but magic. Yeah. But doing it without, uh, doing it without being seen or without, um, killing anyone is... I think it's possible. Like, it's almost certainly possible because there's people who have done it, but that's an endeavor. Well, like, the little bit that I tried not to be seen when I did my low chaos playthrough, like, there's no way in hell I was ever going to get ghost or clean hands. That's just not me. But um, I did do a low chaos, and, like, in low chaos, you can still kill people, and Mm -hmm. you just, like, can't go, you know, murder hobo like I normally do. Um and I don't know how I would have done it without the ability to teleport around. Yeah. Like, there was a lot of teleporting from the top of this lamp to the top of the next lamp and just skirting over their heads. Yeah. 
And and I really um, as a side as a side note, they have Blink. Blink is back if you're Corvo, which is the teleport. <laughs> and the teleport works the, exactly the way you think. You disappear from one point and appear at the next point. Great. I'm used to that from the original one. Emily gets a different ability, Far Reach, which is less like less of a teleport and more of a hookshot. Uh, it's not as fast and it's not instantaneous, which means you can be seen going from point A to point B, which is a problem or can be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It on the other hand, on the other on the flip side, it's like sure it's got this downside. On the flip side, oh, and it's also shorter range than Blink. Uh, on the flip side, you can also you can use it to grab items from a distance. It's like you can pull stuff to you. Can you use it to like flip switches and? Uh, you can't use it to flip switches, but there's very few switches you would need to flip. It's more like, oh hey, that rune is in this. This is a here's a bone charm or a rune in a room full of guards. Rather than dealing with all of the guards, I can just snag the rune and be on my way. Okay, that would have been handy in several cases where you could see the bone charm, but you couldn't get into the room in the first one. Yep, and they give you a bunch of opportunities like that. And if you want, if you want to be real fancy about it, one of the upgrades allows you to grab people. So you can grab someone and knock them out or kill them midair. It's not very stealthy, but if it's just one person, you can just grab them. Um, It also lets you do stuff like, oh, if I need a distraction item or like something flammable, I can grab it from across the room without triggering anything that might see me or notice me, like they're terrible mosquitoes. Rats are rats are in the game, but almost totally unnoticeable because they've been re- they've been replaced by mis- giant mosquito infestations. And Ugh. they're terrible. They're like, they're, ab- they're about as annoying to deal with, with as rats were, but way more intimidating because you have to deal with the buzzing and the fact that they fly around. So, giant bugs. It's the worst. So you can hear them coming, but you can't necessarily see them at first? You can see them, because they're, I mean, about as big as my forearm. They're just, they just flit around like you'd expect from bugs, which means if you're trying to cut them down with a sword, you have to kind of swing it around and hope that you get them. And they get really, really agitated if you get close to their nest. Often their nests are placed between you and where you want to be. And so you spend a lot of time looking around for, like, what can... Can I throw, like, a bottle of whiskey at the nest to light it on fire? Do I have enough fire bolts? Like, I never used incendiary bolts in the original game because they were a murder device, but I use them constantly in uh, in this one because they're, the, they're an incredibly good way of getting rid of these terrible mosquitoes. There are a lot more enemy types in 2 that you can destroy without it counting as a kill. So, like, mos- mosquitoes are one. Almost all wildlife, like anything not a human, is fair game. Um, they have Clockwork Soldiers, which was an incredibly nasty shock for me. Uh, I play, I play information mode, because I don't want to be seen. I need to be able to see things that can't see me. So I take the see-through walls power. The see-through walls power is great, because it lets me see where enemies, within a certain radius, where enemies are and what direction they're looking. And I grow to rely on this, as you might expect. I think I see where this is going. But it says, and I... I register this on the I, on the powers tooltip, but never really think about it. It lets me detect living things. <laughs> Clockwork soldiers <laughs> are not living things. I can't see them. They're also, because they're devised to be watchful sentinels, they are literally constructed with eyes in the back of their heads. That's just mean. They're <laughs> super mean. So you've got to be re- so really finicky about positioning. And also, yeah, those things those things were one of the most difficult mob types to deal with. Um, but you can also kill them without harming your, you your run. And, and it took me a while to figure out how to do this in a reasonable way. Um, because they have a bunch of they have a bunch of very consistent and impeccably well messaged rules. You find all sorts of paper. Y- you in fact find a, a in multiple places a copy of like here's how clockwork soldiers work as an it's that's listed as an explanation to people who buy them or for other guards working with them or whatever but it's a straight this is these are the things that you expect you can expect from them and you'd normally think like oh well that would trivialize them but it absolutely doesn't um because so you can every part of them is protected by an armor plate and you can, if you shoot the armor plate, the armor plate will bounce off, and then exposing whatever's below. 
they have a little battery pack thing in their back under an armor plate that if you shoot if you shoot it they die if you get it the right angle unfortunately the right angle is directly behind them where they can normally <laughs> see you can shoot off their head uh their head is armored which is a problem but if you're really if you're really good or have really good aim you can pinpoint shot at their neck and shoot their head off at which point they can no longer see which means they can't detect you unless you physically attack them which is fine except that at that point they're going entirely by sound for me that's not a problem because i'm mostly silent when i move around however they have a failsafe built in that if their head is blown off they will indiscriminately attack anything that makes sound including other guards which if they die count as kills so if you don't care about that you can shoot the heads off clockwork soldiers make a bunch of noise have them chase you and then hide somewhere while guards get into a fight with it and you solve all of your problems at once <laughs> if you're me you're if you're me and you are dealing with a room that's got guards and clockwork soldiers in it or in one particularly notable case my target and two clockwork soldiers and my target won't stop shouting <laughs> it rapidly becomes a problem uh so yes they were they were a big pain but the the moment at which i realized that i was not going to get the 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 hat trick playthrough was right at the beginning it's one of the first like guard setups you see uh and it's a super simple one it's one i've seen in a million stealth games you have one static guard looking over a big wide open space from an elevated point making it really hard to get past without removing that guard and then you've got a patroller that walks up to that guard and then down to the bottom of this open space and another one off to the side that walks close to that guard and and down with a wall in between them and the other patroller which is you know a fairly standard setup and the way i always deal with this is you and and the way you're positioned is when you approach this space the static guard is facing away from you and i'm like oh this is a trivially easy setup great grab the one guard knock him out drag him around the corner into this into a little alcove before his patroller guy comes back up i think yep okay i know what i'm doing here i wait for the patroller to start walking away they won't see me come around, around come back around the corner grab them knock them out you know standard standard thing except the patroller gets up to the top of the stairs and as i'm waiting for him to turn around and start walking away goes hey where'd this guy go he's supposed to be on duty and goes on alert <laughs> and i'm thinking oh god all right well well he's gonna come around this corner anyway i'll grab him when he comes around the corner because i'm like it's like a set of stairs with two little alcoves on either side and so I figure he's going to walk up the stairs and like start looking around the big space. No, the very first thing he does is look in both alcoves. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's definitely not going to work. Uh, and so I had to get really creative through that section and actually just not get seen by any of the guards with some creative use of throwing bits of glass around to make shattery noises and make them go check out what that was, which I've never had to do. Like, that mechanic has been in stealth games for years now, and I've never used it because it's never seemed like something I have any reason to bother with. Um, but that that simple expedient of, there's supposed to be a guy here and there isn't, let's go find out what happened, suddenly changes the entire dynamic. Uh, and it's really consistent throughout the game. If I, they have all of the, like, the walls of light and other devices that are powered by, like, whale oil, um power supplies and you can pull the power you can basically pull the battery out of those things and they're some you sometimes quite a ways away from whatever the thing is mm -hmm. do they still use whale oil in this this setting uh they use a lot less uh they mostly use windmills they finally decided that hunting horrible cthuloid entities for power was a bad idea i think the whale started fighting back it's not entirely clear what the <laughs> deal is uh except that it's it is you, you find a couple of things that whales are a lot rarer and it's way more dangerous to hunt them. So people don't want to do it and whale oil prices have gone up. So it's not entirely clear for what reason it's more dangerous. My personal opinion is the whales started fighting back. Because frankly, these whales could. They're terrifying. Uh, but yeah, they mostly use windmills, which means you've got to climb up to some place where there's a windmill, usually guarded, and flip a switch on it to turn it off. But if you turn off any of those things, guards who know where stuff is usually your like officers will order other guards to come with them while they go check out what happened and so like 
you know, I knock a couple of guards out that are guarding a, uh, a battery, pull the battery out, leave it next to the thing because I don't need to carry it anywhere, and start to go about my merry way. I see the little, uh, I see the little alert from the other guards because I figure, oh yeah, they're going to notice that the thing is turned off and then look around for a bit and be done. Uh, and so right around the time I get back to the wall of light, I notice it's back on. And it's back on, and the two guys that I knocked out have been revived, have been like shaken awake by their companions, and they've turned the windmill back on. It's like, well, all right, okay. I guess I have to go, like, I have to go deal with this again, uh, and like, and like, actually hide the bodies, and actually like, go put this explosive tank of whale oil or the or the windmill. And, like the windmills, they're just a switch, so like, if they get back to them, they can turn them back on. So I had to go back and be like, okay, now I'm going to wait for the guards to go check it out, and I have to take out all of them, too, as opposed to just avoiding them, which was my original plan. And so the, I, and there's tons and tons of moments like this, just throughout the entire game, where uh, it's just, there's, the guards are so smart, or at least sm- so much smarter than I'm used to, uh, and they can also see you, at least on very hard, they can see you from some absolutely ludicrous distances. I mean, the kinds of distances you'd expect a human being to see someone else moving. Um, But they also don't, they don't have cones of vision. They're like flattened ovals. So they're a lot more, they're a lot more aware of things on their vertical plane than they are, like their their level, than they are things above or below them. Just like a person is. Mm -hmm. Um, And some guards actually, like, and, and you'll notice that's, some guards you'll notice looking up and down, and like clockwork soldiers have a cone and look up and down, but a lot of like the, your lazier guards or your less trained ones don't, so you can kind of slip around them. But it's like, so I start noticing things like the color of the guard's coat lets me know what kind of guard they are and how how responsive I think they're likely to be. If I if I knock those guys out first, then I can do stuff like turn off the power to this to this you know, wall of light and not have the other guards go and check them out. Or if they do, it'll only be one of them and not one, not two guards going up to see what's up while the other two guard the, the exits of the building that I'm in, which is another thing they do is like cover exits of buildings and other such things. I wind up using a lot more tools than I otherwise would. It's, it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly fun playthrough because it's, I feel like there's so many different, I feel like I barely scratched the surface in stuff that I could have done in the game in my first, in just the one playthrough. Um, not to mention their their powers are really, really interesting this time around, uh, depending on how you want to play. Like Corvo's power, Corvo has the same set of powers. So if you like the really good at doing a specific thing type of power, that's that's what Corvo is good at. Emily has a lot of a lot a, a lot of less obvious powers like less immediately powerful powers that have really interesting synergies like she can summon a doppelganger that's just a clone of herself that runs around and creates a distraction or if you upgrade it it fights guards but you can interact with this clone and if you want you can choke this clone out just like you can any other npc which doesn't seem like a thing you would ever have any interest in doing because you just spend a bunch of mana to summon a clone why would you choke it out or shoot it with a sleep dart or whatever except that one of her other powers is something called domino which links any four targets you want and whatever happens to one target happens to all of them (laughs) so you can link you can link some guards with your doppelganger and then sleep dart your doppelganger to knock everybody out and so i spent a lot of time like staring at a room with four guards that are all covering each other and it's like, well, I can't get to these guys. I can't deal with these guys before they notice me, but I can link them all and take one out and they all go down. It's just this great, like, equalizer. There's lots of creative, creative stuff like that. Um, there's some amusing, there's an amusing uh, achievement that I didn't get because I didn't kill anybody, but uh, there's an achievement called The Lovers, which is link two, link two targets with Domino right before one kills the other. <laughs> there are tons the other thing is that there are tons and tons of little vignettes throughout the game that aren't necessarily on the beaten path but actually matter and can create big differences like one of the first things one of the first things i ran into was i was just trying to get onto the rooftops and so i climbed up the stairs of this building and at the top of the building 
there's a guard harassing the newspaper editor and telling him out telling the newspaper editor how he's going to uh telling the newspaper editor like you're going to post positive things about the new empress after the coup and he's you know the newspaper editor is arguing and if you don't do anything then the guardsman is like all right well we'll get somebody else to do your job and goes to stab the newspaper editor um but i can intervene and take the guard out at which point the newspaper editor is still alive which means all of the newspapers that I read from there on out weren't blatant propaganda. And when I needed to come back to that level later, the newspaper editor was still there and had a, and like had some stuff for me and was a safe house. And there's little stuff like that kind of scattered throughout the game, which is really, it's really neat to see. Just lots of little details. And the game like remembers when you do stuff like that too, which I appreciate. But yeah, it's, it, it's been incredibly fun to play. And the... Uh, um i look forward to playing it i just haven't had a chance to this week it's definitely worth it and there's definitely a lot of it's there's so many fun little fun little tidbits um the game also messages way better what level of chaos you're playing at at the end of every level that's good and so if you're like and it's an ag it's a it's an aggregate total so if you're like well i was a little bit too murder happy but i want a low chaos ending you can be like all right i'll throttle it back a little bit it it messages what you can do a lot better um it was also really 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 nice for me because it opens up the combat it displays the combat tutorial whenever you enter combat which happens when you're spotted which meant that i always knew when i had been spotted because i saw the combat tutorial pop up it also you can also check at any time how many times you've been spotted and how many kills you have for that level so if you're tracking oh, that kind wonderful. of thing, it's like, oh, I hit that person. I hit that person up on a rooftop with a sleep dart. I don't know if they fell. You can open the thing and say, oh, nope, they fell. That wasn't a good way of handling that. Yeah, no no getting to the end of the level. And so I, one death. Crap. Yeah. Who, be like, who died? Oh, who was it? God yeah. damn it. Time to start over from the beginning. Yeah. Because it's, it's not just if you murdered somebody. It's also did, did your actions cause someone to die? Yeah, did you did you leave someone unconscious in a place where they got devoured by rats later on? Or yeah. you know, slowly slid off the roof and fell and broke their neck or whatever. Yep, exactly. Um my I think my biggest complaint with the game, um, and it's it's such a nitpicky little thing, but a lot of levels have unique mechanics, but they rarely um some of those mechanics are only in effect for like one level. And so like sometimes sometimes that's good like there's one level that's predicated on this one special mechanic that's like having you shift from one thing to another and it would be and it's really really difficult because you've got to keep track of what's going on in both levels and kind of because the two you're in the same physical space in two different ways trying to avoid spoilers but like it's well, that's same- a that's a special power that only Emily has. No, this is a this is a separate mechanic for that level. It's an item that you get. Okay. That lets you kind of shift between one 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 thing and one way of a level layout and the next for the same level. And so, like sometimes this door is blocked, but you need to get through it. So you'll switch to the other one where the door isn't blocked. Go through it and then switch back to where you actually wanted to be. And that kind of thing. But it means that you've got to keep track of enemy locations, level layout for both at once, which is kind of difficult to do. Um, So I'm kind of glad that that only exists for one level. But there's also, like, enemy combinations that together are really, really scary, but they don't combine them as often as they could. Like, combining clockwork, combining, like, the, the, the mages, like, the, the mage enemies that you run into that are kind of, like, they're a little bit like Dowd's henchmen from the first game, where they have a lot of your same outsider powers. Mm, yeah. Uh, combining them with Clockwork Soldiers is really difficult to deal with, but not something that I ever that I really ever saw. I think maybe once. And so they they have a couple of like one off mechanics. Um, the game also has I I think it is probably my new favorite stealth game level. Um, the last time that was updated was a lot was quite a while ago in Thief Three. Was 
one nobody liked. Sorry, Thief Deadly Shadows, which I liked. I mean, it wasn't the best game ever, but it had one of the best levels, like individual levels. Shellbridge Cradle was an amazing level. Um, but yeah, it's got my favorite. It's got my favorite single level in a stealth game since 2004. So, yeah, a decade ago. Yeah. Or over a decade ago. Yeah, after some after some uh initial after some initial like maneuvering to get access to this place, which is interesting in and of itself, you walk into a building and the very first thing you see is a room with no doors other than the one that you came in and a lever in the middle. And <laughs> and maybe you pull that lever lever. And if you pull that level lever, it will become apparent what is going on in this level really fast. Like this building will make will suddenly make a lot more sense if you pull that lever. You really don't want to pull that lever. Find it like I saw that and I was like, oh no, 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 no. Is there any other way out of this room? But yeah, it's got the it's got the kind of level design that I expect from the Thief team in general. Super, super clever. It's. It is as difficult as you want it to be. Um, it's got lots and lots of fun toys, no matter how you're playing, I think. Uh, I got to use a lot of the toys that I would never have used before, like Spring Razors, for example. Like, Spring Razor, it's, the, it's this like shrapnel mine, this silent shrapnel mine. Yeah. Which they were is... they were a thing that I picked up lots of in the first yeah. dishonored and never ever used. But never used. they murder people. Yeah, because they murder people like brutally. But like, I... I was in super mo- murder mode and I never used them because like there were other easier ways to, to mm-hmm. set things up. Exactly. I, I actually kept a full stock of fully upgraded ones in this game. Cause you know what they're really, really good against clockworks clockworks. Like, they probably don't even notice them. Nope. They don't even notice them and they will tear apart a clockwork soldier. And I am so happy not to have to deal with that nonsense with my, with my regular crossbow. P.S. Regular crossbow. Other thing I almost never used in the original and used constantly in this one. Sometimes just to shoot a wall near a guard to get their attention and make them go looking for whatever shot the crossbow bolt. Like the, the expanded repertoire, repertoire of tricks and, and uses for the tools was great. Um, I also like they used to have drop assassinations where you could drop from a rooftop onto a target and kill them. Now you can drop onto the rooftop and knock them out. Awesome. You can also... They had the thing where previously where if you blocked, if you got your block timing right, you could repost and knock somebody out or and kill somebody with the in, during sword fighting. You can repost and grab them to choke them out now as well. So like you can totally get a no kills playthrough without doing any kind of um without basically reloading every time you get seen which i think i it, there's so many little cool details about that like that it is it is an it is an incredibly fun game that i've got, that i've had a lot of fun messing around with and despite my usual like disinclination of to load up a game that i've just beaten to play it again i'm seriously considering doing it with this one give it a shot as corvo yeah, give it a shot as Corvo, try a flesh and steel run. Like now that I have a slightly better idea of what's going on. It also had an achievement that I couldn't resist trying to get in constri- conscripted Kodra for. Uh it one of the one of the levels has a logic puzzle. A very, very detailed multi-layer logic puzzle. Like one of those things that you have in like elementary school where it's where you set up the grids for it. Oh yeah. Where it's like I love those. Yeah, they're they're really neat. And this one has an incredibly epic one. And the level design is such that you go around currying favor with these various groups that have pieces of the clues to figure out hints to the puzzle or just find the answer. Or you can figure it out yourself. I think Nice. I think uh I could scripted Kodra and it took the two of us sitting in a Google spreadsheet like an hour, but we figured it out. I still have the spreadsheet. He's like, you need to save that spreadsheet for when I play this game. But yeah, sat through and worked through worked through this logic puzzle until we uh, till we found the answer. And you get an achievement for it for not dealing with the factionalized stuff in that level and just solving the puzzle. Probably takes about the same amount of time. But yeah, in short, I might be surprised, but probably my game of the year. I'm gonna go ahead and call it now. We'll see. This uh. There's a couple of other games coming out this year that might surprise me, but uh, you'll probably be hearing me talk more about this game. Cool. 
Paul, I think there's like one last thing on our, our list, and this one just came up out of the blue because right before the podcast, you were telling us about this, Tam, and I mostly think it would be interesting for our listeners. So how did you spend your day? Oh, right. So um, a bit, a little bit of background. Like I'm finishing up my MBA, Master's in Business Administration, um, which is a whole lot of business stuff, but also a lot of courses on leadership and group dynamics, which I suppose I should have thought of this prior to uh, sort of starting the whole program, but corporations put a lot of money into doing very good research on effective leadership, as it turns out. And so there's a lot of really good material, usually paywalled uh, or otherwise not easily accessible, but it's a ve- it's possible to to reach or it's at least kept for like good ways of running teams and good leadership practices and so on and so forth uh and so one of the classes that i'm taking is a course on on team leadership and it's run by a professor who has a kind of cavalier attitude towards the idea of a writing prompt uh his his assignments thus far have literally been write a reflective paper it should be about five pages that's uh, specific. And if you ask what it's supposed to be about, that's part of the test. Because one of his first comments is, this is not a class where you ask for permission, you ask for forgiveness. Write what you want, and if I don't like it, we can talk about it. Otherwise, you do you. For the final project, which is in a group, our, our final group project is, in similarly vague, vaguely defined terms, uh, provide a five to s- provide a five minute video, and then spend five to seven minutes uh, talking about the making of that video, whatever topic you want. Uh, hmm. And my group kind of spun our wheels a little bit, and just honestly, kind of to get the uh, just because it was something I was thinking about, and because I play a lot of games, and just to get the ball rolling on ideas, I suggested, what if we, you know, I know that three of the people in this six-person group don't haven't ever played a video game in their lives and two of them haven't played a game in years like since high school or college what if we all loaded up a game and played it together and see how that all shakes out and like try to accomplish something in a in an environment where most of us aren't familiar with it uh and honestly to my surprise the group thought that was a cool idea and turned out to be what we went with and so then my next job was, how do we pick a game that a bunch of people on a variety of hardware can all play together for as little money as possible? As it turns out, Guild Wars 2 has a free trial and a Mac client. <laughs> so this afternoon, or by, by this afternoon, I mean people showed up at my apartment at 10 a.m. and left at about 6. Uh, three people who had never played a video game before, two people who hadn't played a video game in probably a decade, and me sat down to play Guild Wars 2 and spent a solid like six hours on this endeavor. Uh, I filmed the entire thing via Fraps uh, and as a as a way to sort of shunt group leadership onto one of the other people in the group uh, and for a, for a better movie quality, I turned off my heads up display, meaning I had <laughs> nothing. I could see nothing. I don't know if, I don't know if anybody here has tried to play an MMO without your HUD like I know we turn it off wow. for screenshots, but like or actually like play thirty seconds at a time, maybe. Yeah, I spent. I spent that is a... at least one that it's better than most. It's because true. At least if you swing your sword with something in front of you, you hit something. It's true, but yeah, no UI. It's a it's an endeavor. It also meant that I was utterly beholden to everyone else in the group for like I don't I I don't have enough information. I don't know where to go. I don't know where we are. I've even been to these, I've even been through Caledon Forest a number of times, but like, I can't, I couldn't tell you where I was in that place just by looking around. I don't know it that well. Um, it, was a, it was a really, it was a really fascinating experience. And then we had a bunch of MBA students sitting around talking about the, the intersection between playing a video game and management, which was an equally fascinating conversation. Uh, Cause everybody was seeing, everybody was seeing analogs. I mean, one person's comment was, um, you know, I have a lot more, we had, we had one person whose computer wasn't, who basically 
hadn't patched and didn't have their power cord for their computer because they didn't realize it would be necessary, which mm. precluded any possibility of actually playing the game. And so I had them pull up Guild Wars 2 Cartographer, which is just the online map, the like Google Map style online map. And um, what they did was directed us because they could see the whole map. And they were like, oh, we're going to go over here now. And the comment was, I have a lot more sympathy for people in like the CEO position who seem so clueless because I can see the top down 100 foot map view, but I couldn't see the spiders chasing you guys through the forest. <laughs> and like I and and we talked for like a solid 20 minutes on um, kind of the implications of that, like it. You know, her, her comment was that what I was doing was in a, I was it was ineffective for me to give you direction until I realized that you guys were dealing with higher priority stuff. You were putting out the fire. You were putting out fires that I couldn't see. Like you were fighting this spider that was murdering you while I was trying to tell you to go up the mountain. Like I knew that you need to get up the mountain, but, you know, couldn't see this other thing going on. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of really interesting conversations sort of coming out of that. Uh, I was really excited that like nobody got super frustrated and just quit. Uh, and I also wasn't like, because I wasn't the one guiding the party, I kind of didn't provide input because it wasn't my role, which meant that when she beelined for, uh, Ash may know what I'm talking about. You know, the Caledon forest, uh, Azura jumping puzzle, the I'm one with not familiar with it. There's a, there's a jumping familiar puzzle. With the big spiral one. Yeah. There's another one in Caledon forest that is a fairly well hidden jumping puzzle like deep in a mountain that's an azure lab that is a series of consoles that when you hit them spawn uh short duration platforms over a lava pit like short duration translucent hollow platforms over a oh lava pit. yeah i'm familiar with that one <laughs> yeah i so forgot we... what zone it was in though i thought it was in a way later zone nope that's in caledon forest so i've discovered also it was where <laughs> it was where our person beelined us for so like with with maybe 30 minutes of video game experience people were trying that jumping puzzle and it somehow wasn't a disaster like we actually all got through it and like one of my one of my takeaways was like we spent so much time fighting like level 10 things at level four and like sure one or two of us would go down every single fight but we just get them back up again and keep going. And it was fascinating seeing like, if you don't tell people what they're not supposed to be able to do, they do some incredible stuff. <laughs> like I told people afterward that I have, I have had friends give up on that jumping puzzle because it's too annoying and they couldn't do it. And like, certainly nobody at level four goes out hunting level 10 crabs or whatever. So it was, it was a really, really neat experience just running around and having an adventure with a whole bunch of people who had never run around and had an adventure before and kind of seeing seeing this game that I'm super familiar with through totally new eyes. Honestly, that's one of the things I miss about MMOs is like some of my funnest moments were playing Dark Age of Camelot with like two other friends and we didn't know what we were doing. Like guides and things like that really weren't that sophisticated um, there wasn't as viable a website as Alakazam for Dark Age Camelot. Yeah. So we just tried stuff and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Mm -hmm. And there was this one mob out in the, uh, I forget where it was. It was somewhere in the Shrouded Isles area and it was the Tower Guardian. It was like this giant golem that spawned every so often out near this tower. And we would take it down and farm it for loot. And uh, a friend of ours was like super serious about Dark Age Camelot. And uh, he also ran like a, a miniature gaming store. And we happened to be in there one day over lunch and we were talking about taking down the Tower Guardian. And he was just shocked. He's like, how did you take down the Tower Guardian? And I'm like, we just did it. Like it took us forever, but, but we did it. And he was mm -hmm. like, that's raid content. Like that's designed for you to have like 20 people and sure, it took us forever, and we, we chewed it down, but, like, there were three of us taking this thing down, and he was shocked. <laughs> and, and I kind of miss those days, like, because, like, there's a lot of stuff that I don't even try anymore, because, like, I know this is this is designed for gear levels, you know, well above where I am currently, so I'll come yeah. back later. Yeah, and, and 
it was one of the first times that I've recaptured that like wide-eyed new game experience in a game that I'm very already very familiar with. Like going in with a bunch of new people and letting somebody and and intentionally making sure somebody else was doing the driving was super cool. Like super cool, super fun. I mean, it helped that everybody was was good-natured and into it. Um and like even even our most skeptical team member by the end of it was like wow that was fun uh like how much how much did we get done and the the person who was watching that i was like you got six percent of caladon forest done and he's like oh all right so we could do like you know 17 18 month 17 18 times that and we'd be and we'd be she finishes done with one zone <laughs> <laughs> he was like oh wow i can see how somebody might sit down and play this for months or years like wow, there's that much of this? Like, this felt this felt super busy and super dense, and we did so much stuff, and that was 6% of one zone? How many zones are there? And she's like, there's like, I don't know, 30? Yeah. <laughs> yep. It was, it was really, it was a really cool experience. Well, and honestly, like, that's one of the things that I've learned in Guild Wars 2, or in Rift, or any game that has live activities going on is that I tend to enjoy myself more if I allow myself to just go with the flow. Like, whatever happens to be going on, stop and participate in it. And then move to the next thing. And allow yourself to get, like, off the beaten path in, oh, look, there's a thing over here. Let's go do this thing. Oh, look, there's a thing going on in this little area. Let's go over there. That happens to me a lot when playing Guild Wars 2. Yeah. Well, this afternoon, like, while playing Rift, I... I, I was like trying to focus on a quest and then I just like, no, let's let's deal with this invasion that's going on because like here's all these people fighting it. And, you know, it was much more enjoyable to do that than to just like focus down on trying to get leveling done. And a lot of my time spent in Suramar and like World of Warcraft has been just wandering around and seeing what I could find. And I, and I think that's part of why it took me so long to get through it was that I didn't really want to focus on this thing or that thing. I was enjoying finding weird little things like the Murloc quest line. And But I think the challenge is, is at this point, we all know this is the efficient way to get through content. Yeah. Yep. And and playing with people who don't is is like a totally different experience. Also, it's really funny seeing how people who you know in other contexts change in the context of a game yeah <laughs> like our our like super gung-ho like ex-military like you know super type a personality guy as soon as we get in the game he's like is everybody in this is everybody in the right place he like turned into he turned into like doting parent like is everybody here let's make sure everybody's here before we move on let's keep let's keep everybody together and like one of the most quiet people in the group was just hyper aggro running off kill everything kind of like the first time you know we introduced ray to a pvp game yeah well that was a personality we didn't know existed right and that and that too came up in the in in our post-mortem like it was people found it really interesting like wow change the context just a little bit and you see a whole new side of somebody it was it was a reminder not that i not that i always need them but it's it was a reminder of why I love online games because it isn't it isn't just I have a bunch of friends who play them and I play them with them. I'll bet a lot of it, but there's it's more than that. Well, I think sometimes you forget that you didn't always know these people. Yeah, like you you met them at some point through the context of this game or that game. Yeah, exactly. And it's 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 really cool. Games bring games bring people together. I think in many ways, games bring out probably the truest version of ourselves. They certainly bring out, like, parts of... They, they bring out... They, they've got that nice, like, mix of relaxing and stressful that, that bring out, like, you know, really interesting parts of people. But anyway, yeah, that was my day. I just found that super interesting when you were telling the few of us that were on earlier about it. It was a, it was a really fun... It was a really fun experience. Well, we've reached that point where we've been recording a while. Anybody else have any final thoughts that they want to talk about? No. Okay, no. 
I expect to hear a bit about Pokemon probably next time we talk. Yeah, which is yeah. actually going to be two weeks from now because due to Thanksgiving, we are going to take next week off because reasons. Yes. So in that case, we will see you in two weeks and hopefully you have had a wonderful Thanksgiving if you are American like us. Or, I don't know, who all celebrates Thanksgiving? I don't... The United States, at least at, the, at this time. Yeah. Yeah, like other Canada's countries have their own Thanksgivings at other times. But, like, I, I've heard of friends in other countries having a Thanksgiving thing on our Thanksgiving, so maybe it's that's... often related to, like, expats. And... Yeah. But anyway, if you celebrate Thanksgiving, hopefully you have a good one. And if not, have a good week, because <laughs> it'll be two weeks, so... Yeah, stuff and things. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good one. Good night.